Okay, good afternoon, uh, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us uh, for this side event on the EPR of uh, Iran. Uh, this side event is organized by uh, Sudwind. Uh, myself, I'm Glenn Payo, I'm working for uh, Impact Iran. And uh, I'm joined uh, on, on here with, uh, by a number of uh, panelists that I will introduce a little bit uh, later. Uh, as you all know, the, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran will be reviewed uh, by the UPR working group uh, in two days uh, on Friday morning. And we, wanting, we wanted uh, to, to take this opportunity side even to, to give some space uh, to Iranian activists, to, to Iranian human rights defenders, so that they can share with you, with the audience, uh, their feelings about the process, their, anal their analysis of the engagement of the Islamic Republic uh, of Iran in this European process uh, and, and, and a few more points. So without further ado, let me introduce as uh, speakers, starting from my left, uh, uh, Diana Lai, I don't know if I really need to, to, to present uh, Diane. Diane uh, has been for a few years uh, a representative to the UN of the Baha'i International Community based in, in Geneva. Um, then we have on my right, uh, Sholé Zamini, who is working for uh, Sudwin uh, in the project All Human Rights for All in Iran, uh, who is based in Australia, but, uh, but uh, coming will be here very often here in, in Geneva at the Council. She's the HRC representative from Sudwin. And uh, on my far right, uh, we have Rod Anjadi. Rod is the executive director of the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center, uh, which, is based in, which is based in the, in the US. So I think we can start uh, with you, Diane. Uh, so I'll give you the floor for uh, unfulfilled promises, really clean analysis of, of the, the outcome of the uh, first uh, cycle, the first review in 2010, and, and what happened with the recommendations of four years later. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, organizing this and for uh, inviting me to, to speak. Um, <coughs> At the Baha'i International Community, of course, we were there four and a half years ago when Iran had, had its first uh, review. And um, in a way, to our surprise, we saw that the government of the Islamic Republic, but to our good, good surprise, um, we saw that the government of the Islamic Republic had accepted a number of recommendations um, that would address the situation of the Baha'is and would, uh, if implemented, actually um, make that situation, improve that situation in Iran. So um, during these past uh, four and a half years, we have been monitoring these recommendations that they accepted and uh, to see whether this has had any effect or not. Um, so basically after four and a half years, we were able to produce a, a report, which is this report um, that's called Unfulfilled Promises, and you have their copies also at the entrance if you're interested in, in having, but it's also available online. And that regrettably show that uh, in fact, none of the recommendations that were um, either directly and specifically mentioning the Baha'is, or indirectly uh, talking about uh, situations of religious freedom in Iran, or uh, education, or uh, rights of minorities, that Iran accepted um, were not implemented. I must say that there were also other recommendations, which were also excellent recommendations, that were not accepted by Iran. But we decided that since the UPR is, um, since Iran, I would say rather, uh, uh, repeatedly says that you know it doesn't accept the special rapporteur, Mr. Ahmad Shahid, that this mandate is not a, a mandate that is good because it's political. It has political, but that UPR is the right place for looking at um, situations of human rights. We therefore thought that this would be the best um, a way to try to uh, take Iran to task in some ways. So um, I will first quickly, because that's not in our, in, our, in our publication, but I will first quickly go to the national report that Iran um, uh, released before actually the, just the UPR and about its, um, its uh, response to some of the questions of the situation of the Baha'is. Uh, there are two, two, two specific things that the Iranian government says, which I would like to clarify here. 
The first one um, is that it says that there is, uh, although the Baha'is are not recognized as a religious minority in the Constitution, so at least they admit that, um, but they have always, um, you know, Baha'is, Iranian Baha'is as citizens have all the right to citizenship. Well, as you will see from the report, for example, Baha'is do not have access to employment. They're not allowed to work in the public sector at all. And even in the private sector, there are a lot of um, uh, restrictions that is imposed on them, in, in particular excluding them from a certain number of businesses, but also for having, for example, their shops closed because they closed, they were closed on behind holidays. So, the Baha'i faith has different holy days than the Muslim holidays. And so Baha'is, of course, don't work during those days. Like any believer of any religion doesn't work on specific days. So Baha'i owners of shops close their shops. And yet, um, if those shops are closed, then they're shut down by the government because they would be doing propaganda for the Baha'i faith. So just closing a shop on a Baha'i holiday is considered a crime of um, doing propaganda for the Baha'is. Um, also, as you know, uh, I think because this is one of the issues that has been of great concern to everybody, um, because it's so uh, dramatic, the, the effect is so dramatic on a whole community, is the fact that Baha'i youth are not allowed to study in Iranian universities. So as soon as they're identified Baha'is. So most of the time that they're not allowed upon registration, and um, sometimes, if they're not identified immediately once they're registered, as soon as they're identified, they're expelled. Um, so I think that these show that uh, these two examples of employment and access to education clearly show that the Baha'is don't enjoy citizenship rights like all Iranians. Um, what, whereas this is what the government said in its national report. The other thing that the government said in its national report is that uh, the seven uh, former leaders of the Baha'i faith in Iran, um, or who are also known by the name of Yaron in Iran, um, had a fair trial. This was part of the recommendation because their trial was during the last uh, UPR. And so there were a number of specific recommendations made about you know, having a fair trial. And, um, so the Iranian government uh, said that not only did they have a fair trial, um, they're also allowed to all the same uh, rights as any other prisoner um, to uh, sick leave and furlough and visiting. So uh, to go to the trial, I think when we launched our publication, we also had a, an event in, in September to launch this publication, and we had the chance to have Mrs. Mahnas Parakan, who is one of the lawyers, um, of, of one of the four lawyers of, um, of these seven Baha'i leaders. Of course, two lawyers are outside, Mrs. Shirin Ebadi, Nobel Peace Prize winner, and Mrs. Mahnas Parakan had to leave the country. And then the two other lawyers, uh, Mr. Uh, Abdul Fattah Sultani is actually in prison himself now, just for being a human rights defender and human rights lawyer. And uh, Mr. Hadi Esmail Zadeh is also indicted, so he could be taken in at any time. So the lawyers, and Mrs. Pa Mrs. Mahmoud Parakan, but we know that Mrs. Zabadi has also said this, have said that not only were the charges complete, completely unsubstantiated, there is no one proof of the crimes that they have been accused of, but there were a number of grave um, breaches of even Iranian procedural law during the trial. So clearly their trial was not uh, fair and uh, in the way that it should have been. Um, concerning the rights of visitation and uh, uh, and medical care and furlough, uh, we must say that um, the Baha'i uh, prisoners, uh, the Yaran, so the seven former leaders, but also all other Baha'i prisoners, are uh, generally, are in Tehran, held in the uh, political section of 
uh, the prisons, whether it's in Evin or in uh, Bohadash, uh, Rajai Shah of Karaj. And um, these uh, don't have the same circumstances as other prisoners. They are much more limited in the amount of time. So it's for all prisoners of conscience. It's not only the Baha'is. They're limited in um, the time that they have to have fresh air. They're, um, they don't have access to the phone and call their families in the same way. Um, they are under surveillance. There is you know, camera surveillance of the, of the, of the prisons. Um, so the situation for all of them is certainly not the same as others. But on top of it, um, for uh, the Baha'is, uh, and the Yaron particularly, sorry, for the Yaron, for the seven former leaders, that the Iran in its national report says that they have the right to furlough, it is not true. They have not been allowed one single day, and they've been held for over six years now. They have not been allowed one single day of furlough and in fact, um, one of them, Mr. Khan um, his wife passed away during the time of his detention, and he was not even allowed to go to his wife's funeral. So I think this is, um, this, these are the two issues that uh, we wanted to raise. Maybe I just remember now a third one about the, um, the uh, Iranian government's response. They say that, of course, Baha'is are not above the law, and if they commit crimes, they will be in prison like any other Iranians. Baha'is don't want to be above the law. They just want to be normal citizens, which they're not. Um, and so therefore, um, uh, and if you look at the crimes that they're, um, they are convicted of, um, they're not normal crimes. And of course, if a Baha'i commits a normal crime, I don't know, whatever, um, they will certainly go to prison and we will not uh, raise the issue at all because this is a question of justice and we believe in the rule of law. But in the cases of the Baha'is who are in prison, and today there are over a hundred of them, um, the situation is far beyond just uh, crime, but the crime, their crime is being the Baha'i. So I think that the twist that the Iranian government gives to this is that they consider that being a Baha'i is a crime. And so therefore, you can be in prison because you have violated, violated the Iranian law. But of course, that's completely uh, in opposition to Article 18 of the ICCPR, which Iran has not, has not only signed and ratified, but also is in the submissions, uh, in the in the recommendations that they have accepted that they would abide by ICCPR. Um, a, a few other things that I wanted to raise, aside from what I said about arbitrary detention, which is the situation of the Baha'is, um, and and the other issues that I have raised, is um, two points that are quite dramatic. Um, the first one is incitement to hatred. Uh, we have reported that from just January to June of this year, 2014, over 800 articles, um, posts on websites, um, radio program, TV program, uh, have been produced that are attacking and spreading lies uh, about the Baha'i faith and the Baha'i beliefs and what the Baha'is do. And this, um, if we believe, if the Iranian government wants to come back and say, well, in Iran there is freedom of the press, there is freedom of expression, then in Iranian law, there is also, in the Iran, Iranian press law, there is also a right of reply. But the Baha'is are never given the right to reply to these false allegations that are made against them. So in fact, this campaign is condoned by the Iranian government because there is no possibility for the Baha'is to counter those attacks against them. Moreover, the um, as you know, uh, as you may know, the television and the radio are governmental. So therefore, this shows that there is actually a genuine um, a will on the part of the government to create hatred and to incite hatred against the Baha'is. And this is really worrying um, when you have then acts, criminal acts, um, against Baha'is um, that are never prosecuted on top of it. So it's, a, it's condoned by the government. 
The second thing um, that I wanted to say is that Baha'is are not even protected once they're dead. The anger and the hatred of the Iranian government against the Baha'i community goes so far as to actually going and desecrating Baha'i cemetery. And in the most recent case, which was actually the object of a, um, of a, a statement by three special rapporteurs, the special rapporteur on Iran, the special rapporteur on freedom of religion, and the special rapporteur on minorities, um, addressed the case of the Baha'i cemetery in Shiraz that was not only desecrated, but actually bones were, de I mean, bodies were deterred and bones were put in a trench. This under the excuse that the government wanted to build, I think, a sports center. Um, the truth is that next to the Baha'i Cemetery, there is also an empty space where that sports center could be very well built. So um, really, uh, this shows, unfortunately, that um, uh, the, uh, the persecution of the Baha'is uh, continues even when they're uh, dead. And I just want to say one thing, and I'll finish, uh, just conclude. I just wanted to say one thing. In that cemetery were buried people who were at the beginning of the revolution killed because they were Baha'is. So maybe just to give a little bit of a human dimension to all this, imagine if you have had your husband, your daughter, your wife, your son, killed only because he's a Baha'i or she's a Baha'i, and then buried there. And now, some 30 years later, 25 years later, you have that same government who has killed him or her go and dig their bones and make a building out of the places where they're laid to rest. This is the reality of some of the Baha'is in Shiraz, for some of the Baha'is in Shiraz. So basically what we're expecting, um, the Iranian delegation will come and uh, we hope that the number of governments that we urge um, those delegations who are present here if they haven't already decided to, uh, to, uh, to raise uh, and make recommendations particularly about the case of the Baha'is because as Iran says that the Baha'is is a, not a recognized religious minority, is referring to religious minorities not enough. They've actually in the report underlined this, recognized religious minorities to say that that is applicable to everybody except the Baha'i. So um, uh, we, we hope that uh, there would be recommendations that would specifically mention the Baha'i by name. And we hope also that Iran will this time around decide to actually not only accept recommendations, but in fact also try to implement them, with, which would be a good um, decision that the Iranian government could take um, this 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 round of the of the UPR. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Diane, for the very comprehensive update on the, situ on the situation of uh, Baha'is uh, in Iran, for your uh, suggestions and for sharing your expectations for this. Uh,